Hello and welcome back to Bookish and welcome back to my uh, short story project. This month's short story was A Good Man is Hard to Find by Flannery O'Connor. What I've been doing every month this year is taking one uh, short story, kind of classic American short story from an American author, and kind of discussing that story, leaving a link, uh, hopefully to a PDF of the story so you can read the story for free, uh, down below, and then discussing that story. Uh, and this story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, is probably one of the most anthologized stories uh, in 20th century American uh, literature and fiction. And Flannery O'Connor has uh, a reputation of being one of the great American short story writers of all time. Now, in my Saturday HodgePodge video, I did a, uh, a, a brief discussion about uh, relatively recent uh, exposure of Flannery O'Connor's having very racist ideas and expressing some very racist ideas, uh, from some very racist thoughts in some letters. And I said I would be reading this story with an eye towards seeing, uh, you know, if racism, if her racism had kind of affected the story in direct or subtle ways. And I did that. And I have to be honest with you, while there is presence of racism on the part of one of the characters, which I'll talk about, um, there doesn't appear to be, to me, and maybe somebody else can uh, correct me on this, there doesn't appear to be that in terms of the author's influence, the author's idea influencing the story. So real quickly, just to run down the plot, uh, in case you've never read it, and I'll just tell you up front, short stories are not things you can save spoilers from. Uh, I'm sorry, to talk about a short story, you have to talk about the whole thing. Uh, so this will be kind of spoilery. But the plot, uh, a family who lives in Atlanta, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, is going on a family vacation. The family's made up of mom and dad, a baby, two young children, and Grandma. And Grandma is by far the most important character. They're headed down to Florida. Grandma does not want to go to Florida. She wants to go to Tennessee, uh, which is where she was from, where she grew up. And this kind of begins this idea of Grandma being stuck in the past, which is really important to understanding uh, the problems Grandma creates on this trip. At first, she feels sorry for Grandma because the other two adults, her son, uh, the father of the kids, and his wife just simply ignore her. And then the two uh, young kids, her two grandchildren, are are rude to her. And, you know, this is kind of, uh, if you're from the South, this is kind of shocking that kids would be rude to their grandmother in this way. And you start to feel kind of sorry for her. I promise you, you know, at points in the story, at some point in the story, you will stop feeling sorry for her. Uh, you might later on near the end, but you will stop. Anyway, one of the reasons she doesn't want to go to Florida, she get, or the stated reason she doesn't want to go to Florida, is because there's an escaped convict and his gang on the loose somewhere between Georgia and Florida, and that convict goes as the misfit. And she more or less says, you know, if she were a parent, she wouldn't take her kids anywhere near where the misfit was. Um... And this is pretty much the only thing she's right about. I'll go ahead and tell you. Anyway, they go on the car trip. Uh, in the car trip, you know, uh, the the dad and the mom and the kids are dressed for comfort. You know, like you probably like to dress on a car trip. But Grandma is dressed up. She's dressed to the nines. She has an address and a hat. And she is she's wearing gloves. She is the epitome of, you know, a southern lady. That's what she is. And a lot, as they drive along, she finds scenes of, you know, the South, uh, old plantations, old uh, graveyards, uh, which remind her of the past, and she still tells stories about her past, all kind of with this idea that she's uh, fixated on the past. They stop and eat lunch at a roadside diner, and the grandma decides the proprietor is, is this incredibly good man, and this is where the line, a good man is hard to find, uh, kind of comes from. Uh, which I think has some implications, obviously, later on in the story, and they continue on their way. I'll talk about the grandmother's the evidence of the grandmother's racism here in just a minute, but just so you know, on this trip, we get exposed to, you know, grandma's ideas uh, about African Americans uh, become clear. But as they're taking this trip, as they're going along, she's telling a story about some really fancy plantation home that she visited once uh, when she was younger. And she's kind of overwhelmed by this desire to see it. Uh, and so she begins talking about it and she realizes it because she's kind of manipulative, <laughs> kind of being a, you know, an understatement, that if she gets the kids on her side, then maybe she can get her son, their father, to drive her to where this plantation home is. And so she talks about all these secret panels and stuff like that. 
And her son eventually says, okay, look, we'll go, we'll look at it, but this is the only side trip we're taking. It seems clear that these kind of things have happened before. And so they turn around and they take a dirt road that she says leads to the house and they're going along this dirt road. Well, along with dressing to the nines and bringing her own lunch, Grandma's also packed the family cat because she doesn't want to leave the cat behind. And as they're driving along down this dirt road, you know, theoretically in search of this, or not theoretically, in search of this plantation home, Grandma has it, Grandma remembers that the home she's talking about is in Tennessee and not in Florida. And when she remembers that, she kind of jumps in her seat. And when she does, the cat gets loose. And when the cat gets loose, it's scared and it jumps on her son, the driver, and like claws him in the neck. He uh, steers the car off the road. The car goes down an embankment, tumbles over. You know, his wife uh, and the baby in her arms are thrown out of the car. And you know, grandma's thrown up in the fr thrown up into the front seat. The car turns over once and comes to rest. Rest the bottom's embankment, kind of in a ditch. And this is where the misfit and his gang show up because the misfit and his gang, of course, are right there, and they come to uh, inspect to see what's happened. Um, and this is where the misfit and grandma meet, and this is where really the tragedy of the story takes place. Because over like the last seven pages of the story, essentially what we have is a conversation of increasing intensity between the misfit and grandma uh, as the misfit's gang members essentially kill uh, her family. Um, and she's constantly uh, trying, trying to talk him out of this while this is going on, uh, which kind of is the most interesting part of the story and, and, and the most important part. By the way, it's also her fault that the misfit has to kill them because she blurts out that she knows who he is and that he's the misfit and he says wow i wish you hadn't said that lady and that then leads directly to the death of her family so she is you know fully responsible at this point uh, for what has happened you know that in effect she's done something wrong um, that her obstinance and her desire to have what she wants her selfishness has resulted in this so I want to talk a lot. I want to talk more about the the conversation between the misfit and, and grandma that comes at the end of the book. But I do want to talk about grandma's racism, her constant uh, calling back to the past, uh, is in lots of ways uh, evidence of her belief that the old South and the ideals of the old South, as represented by her dressing up and her manners and her ideas about the way things should be. Um, that she has Old South ideas. And this comes most clearly to mind as they're driving along. And they drive by a shack and they see a little African-American boy standing in the doorway of this dilapidated shack and he doesn't have any pants on. Uh, the grandma uses two racial uh, epithets, the N-word and a word, racist term that was used to describe uh, African-American children. Uh, she uses both of those words uh, in her description. And then she says that, you know, she thought thinks it's a beautiful scene and she wished she was a painter. She she could go back and paint this scene of this incredibly poor, pantsless African-American boy standing in the doorway of a shack. Well, <laughs> that seems to indicate that she thinks that's the way things should be, that this is an idealized picture for her, uh, which is, you know, I think a fairly clear sign that she is a racist. And so... It would be somewhat comforting if we thought, I guess, that grandma's racism was a part of their decline. But I, in reading the text, I could really find uh, no evidence that that was true. So then what we get then in the last seven pages of the book is this kind of confrontation between, between grandma and the misfit. And the whole time they're having this conversation, the misfit is directing his other two gang members to take various members of her family out in the woods and shoot them, uh, that that's what's going on. And so as it gets closer and closer to her turn to being the last one, uh, she becomes more and more uh, unhinged. And in lots of ways, the uh, misfit himself becomes uh, angrier and angrier. So she starts off by, you know, after she's recognized him and used his name so that now he doesn't feel like he has any choice but, but to kill her and her family. She starts off by talking about how she can tell by looking at him that he came from a good family. In other words, she thinks that he's a good man. And he, she tells him this all the time. And he says, no, nope, I'm not. I'm not a good man. You know, I went to prison. And she says, well, you came from a good family. And he says, yes, my father and mother were, were great people. Uh, you know, some of the finest people on earth. And, you know, my father said from the very beginning that I was going to be trouble and a troublemaker. And it's turned out to be true. And then you find out that maybe his dad wasn't such a great person. He just didn't get caught by 
the police very often or he didn't go to prison for the crimes he committed. And as this conversation goes on and her family members are being executed by the Misfits gang, we find out more and more. The Misfit uh, was sent to prison uh, and it, he says it's for a crime he didn't remember. There are hints that the crime he committed uh, was actually, you know, killing his father um, and that that's why he was in prison. He describes being in prison uh, like being buried, uh, like being buried alive um, and being surrounded. And that therefore, he's describing going to prison as a kind of death, uh, which is important, I think, for the religious discussion that kind of plays out as, as they go along. So the whole time this is going on, Grandma is, you know, encouraging the young man to think about Jesus and to think about salvation and to, you know, pray and to do all these things to try to, she's hoping to appeal to his, to his conscience, to his better nature. And we find out pretty quickly he really doesn't have one. Um, he lists some things uh, which seem kind of remarkable and I have questions about, uh, I have a real question about whether or not this is actually possible. Um, he lists some things that he's done, and so I'm just going to read you the list. He see, he was in uh, both the Army and the Navy, at home and abroad. He was married twice. He was an undertaker. He worked on the railroads. He worked as a farmer. He'd been in a tornado. He'd seen a man burned alive once, uh, and he'd seen a woman flogged. That's a lot of different things to, to have done for somebody who went to prison at a relatively young age, somewhere around 19 19. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's a wide variety of things, and it has that kind of feeling. For me, it reminded me of uh, the Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil, where the devil is listing all the things he's been and all the things he's done. And I think that, even though Flannery O'Connor would not have heard that song, I think that she's essentially giving us an idea that the misfit is kind of this universal character, this almost timeless character, this character who's experienced uh, lots and lots of things. So then the question is, you know, why uh, has he turned to evil? Well, in part, this has to do with the fact that he felt like he was punished unfairly. He was punished for a crime he couldn't remember doing. And I'll point out the crime that apparently the crime he can't remember doing is killing his father. And one of the things he thought was unfair about his punishment was that he was punished for something and other people who did bad things weren't. And I think this is direct reference to his father. And he took that punishment uh, on into his own hands. Uh, and that's what landed him in the prison the first time. At some point, as the, as the grandma becomes more and more, um, as she becomes more and more desperate, she just begins to say the word Jesus over and over again. And O'Connor points out that at some point, her saying Jesus sounded, started to sound more like she was cursing. Um, cursing the misfit uh, and cursing instead of actually, you know, calling on Jesus to help her. And then at some point, at the beginning of a lot of her sentences, she says Jesus, and then she just says something directly to the misfit as though she's calling him Jesus, which in a sense makes, which makes some sense because at that point she realizes that her salvation lies with the misfit, that the only person who can save her, that's going to save her, is in fact the misfit. So the misfit sets himself up in opposition to Jesus and he blames Jesus for a lot of the problems that exist. So let me read you this quote which I think is the most important one. The misfit talks and speaks increasingly setting himself in opposition uh, to Jesus. Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, the misfit continued, and he shouldn't have done it. He thrown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you've got left the best way you can by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. No pleasure, but meanness, he said, and his voice had become almost a snarl. The misfit seems to be saying that because Jesus raised the dead and because Jesus was resurrected, which I'll point out, uh, Jesus was raised from the dead and saved from his tomb, and the misfit wasn't. Because that was true, uh, the misfit only saw two ways to go about life. One, you followed Jesus, or two, you committed yourself to a life of cruelty and meanness because that was the alternate path. If Jesus was real and if Jesus had really raised the dead, then you had to follow Jesus. But since the misfit didn't have any proof that Jesus had raised the dead, and the misfit felt like he had been unjustly imprisoned, uh, buried, 
and he hadn't been raised from the dead, it's clear that he's chosen a life of meanness, a life of cruelty, in which he intends to live out his days, killing and burning people's houses down and just doing general meanness. At that point, uh, you know, after another brief speech, the misfit says, he gets increasingly agitated, he stands up, he's face to face with uh, the grandma, she looks at him and says, you look just like one of my babies. He takes a step back and he shoots her three times in the chest and kills her. So a really kind of brutal end uh, to the story. And when one of his gang members says, hey, wow, she talked a lot. That was a lot of fun. You know, funny, huh? He says there's no fun in it. It's just meanness. And he said, you know, she would have been a good woman if there'd been somebody there to shoot her every day of her life. Which brings up a lot of really interesting questions. You know, I don't doubt the grandma's uh, Christian faith, but does it save her? No. In the end, does she abandon it for just simply pleading for her life and switching her allegiance to saying, you know, going from saying Jesus could save the misfit to essentially praying to the misfit for salvation? Uh, are we supposed to question her faith? Are we supposed to question the sincerity of everything she did? Is the misfit the devil? Is he actually Satan? Uh, is that what we're supposed to believe? Anyway, I have a lot of questions, and um, I don't know that I have a lot of answers. As many times I've read the story, uh, the ending becomes more and more uh, confusing and obscure to me the more I read it. So I'd be happy to see and really look forward to seeing your ideas about that in the comment section below. And as always, thank you for watching.